All right, it's 11 a.m. Speaking with the CEO of American Eagle Gold, Tony Moreau, um, and I think the VP of Exploration for American Eagle Gold will join us shortly. Um, but American Eagle had some great results out earlier this week, actually Monday morning. Uh, they put out, I believe it was five holes in total, the last holes of their 2023 program at the NAC project. And hole 17 in particular was very impressive. In fact, it's the best hole American Eagle has drilled at NAC. 302 meters of 1.09% copper equivalent, you know, within 606 meters of 0.74% copper equivalent. Um, some really nice gold grades in there and about 0.4% copper. And a nice molly kicker. I'm not sure everybody paid attention to that, but there was some almost a pound of molly in some parts of that hole. Um, so, Tony, I'll start with you. Tell us about the news you put out on Monday and, and hole 17. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It was our best hole that we've drilled so far, but I want to premise the fact that, you know, it's it's one of the best holes in the region in BC, kind of outside of uh, the Golden Triangle, you know, over the last couple of years. We, we've gone through all the different holes that all the companies have released, and, you know, it's it's up there, if not, if not the best. And, uh, you know, people look at the Golden Triangle, but what they don't realize, no one's been there. It's it's very, very tough to access. It's got a lot of snow and you know, our property. Infrastructure is important. You can you can drive a semi right right onto it. It's right next to Smithers. So you know, I always say we got Golden Triangle Tanner in uh, you know, in Smithers. So yeah, why was 2317, you know, important? Um, look, tough market still. Uh, you need something to really kind of make people wake up, and, and that that hole certainly did, you know. The old saying is we're always looking for 100 meters of 1%. People would, would pay attention. And, you know, we've given a couple of those and, you know, people kind of forgot about us. But I always like to say, like, this this is a Chilean hole in, in BC. And it wakes people up. So it's great. Um, it was a step out from, uh, you know, any historical collared hole in the uh, on a property. It was 250 meters away from the closest hole ever drilled. Um, and it started, you know, northwest of 2311, which was one of our other best holes. And it kind of scissored down across towards the southeast. And it was a bold step out because no one had drilled that far west, which is, you know, really interesting. And we, we hit mineralization a lot closer service than we thought. And kind of fast forwarding that whole west part, we, we were going to, we want to connect like the south and, and north zone, which by the way, we think is one zone. Um, but now it's like now we can focus more on the west. We think it probably opens up more to the west and possibly, you know, comes to surface, you know, further to the west, maybe 100 meters, which is absolutely amazing. But, you know, hole 2308, 2311 kind of uh, scissored across those. But the fear with those was and why 2317 was so risky because it gives away it would have given away some of the blue sky. And the fear was maybe 2308 and 2311 it went down kind of a narrow zone down a vein or something like that. Um, and then when we drilled 2317, the mineralization started west of where 2311 uh, was, and it went all the way across. And then what we kind of uh, almost come to a conclusion at now is that 2308 and 2311, 2317 went through a high grade zone. And if you look at that 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 hole that we have, and combine it with 0811, um, you have a high grade zone there. You know, a thumb suck of 300 meters wide. 400 meters deep and so far about 100 125 meters you know across and, and you're starting to build scale and, and really high grade uh, mineralization and that's really really important because we always thought this this deposit potential deposit was mineable um, but having that you pay back your, your capital right away and um, it's that that kind of high grade zone that I was talking about it's open to the west and it's open you know north going towards hole 20 through 22. 2312 and 2204. So high grades key because we know we have scale here. We know we have a big body of mineable Highland Valley, quote unquote, uh, grade ore. But within that, we have high grade stuff that you'll be able to either have block cave or an open pit 
and pay back the cost of mine relatively quickly and hopefully, you know, run this potential mine for 40, 50, 60 years, kind of like what's happening with Highland Valley. So that's why 2317 was important on the geology and mining side. But, you know, for us, it's just so people really start to pay attention. And technically speaking, I know you're a technical uh, guy, Rob, but, you know, we had to blow past that kind of 31 cents resistance and we finally got back. So the sky is kind of limits. You know, for me, it's like, it's great for us to be able to hit that 51 cents, but when you go that high that quickly, obviously there's a bit of a, a sell-off, but I'm hoping that we form a bit of a base here and, and start to make another run. So, um, yeah, yeah, what a hole. But, but Rob, one more thing. Mm-hmm. Do not do not think that's going to be the best hole we drill. Because mm-hmm. historically, until now, we've basically drilled off geophysics. Now, uh, wait till we start drilling off geology. That's the best way to really hone on to really good targets. The, the best pathfinder for copper and gold is copper and gold. Um, yeah, and so you 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 put a slide in your updated presentation that was out on Monday morning and 2024 planning slide. And the first bullet point is prioritize this new area of high grade around hole 2317. So let me ask Neil, um, how big could this area of high grade be around hole 2317? And, and how many holes do you need to sort of test this properly? Oh, it's, it always helps when I activate the speaker. <laughs> Neil, you there? Okay. Did, uh, did you hear my question? Yeah, so asking how large do we think this, this high grade area could be around uh, 2317 yeah yeah so i mean right now like tony said you know we see it in that envelope section that about 150 meter wide envelope section within 300 meters east west dimension and 400 meters in the vertical dimension of a very strong grade um <clears throat> we uh, it's it's open as we get further to the west and closer to surface, and it's also open as we step to the north. Now, hole 16, step to the north uh, at a bit of a lower elevation extent and, and collared further, a little bit further to the east. Um, and it still hits some narrower, but like in the 70 to 100 meter wide zones of around 0.55 to 0.6 copper equivalent. And now, as we step up a little bit higher above that and further to the west, it, it looks like that is pointing to another <clears throat> higher grade zone to the north. And like Tony said, like right now we're we're piecing together the geology. It's fairly complicated between the interaction of our mineralized sedimentary host rock and the presence of a couple different phases of, of copper mineralized diking, which seem to be associated with envelopes within the host rock of a good disseminated and veined grade. So what it's looking like right now, <clears throat> and this isn't, by no means, this isn't going to be what the, what the deposit looks like once we get a, a full handle on a, on a resource potentially, you know, down the road. Um, but it looks like we've got a very, very broad zone of, you know, between 0.2 and 0.3 copper equivalent. And within that, some pretty sizable higher grade zones. And now these higher grade zones might not be completely contiguous with each other, but we know we have another very similar high grade zone about 550 meters to the north where we hit hole four and hole 12. Um, And stepping to the south of that in hole 13, we hit another pretty good, it was about 196 of close to 0.5 percent copper to the south and it looks like that could slightly pinch out and then expand again and get these these higher grade zones so as as we step to the north based on what we've seen here and 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 what we know about our position within the geophysical anomaly and its geological proximity to the the main driving source that Babine porphyry stock uh, we have every indication that these higher grade zones are going to continue to be discovered I noticed you guys did a video, you know, Neil, and you, you mentioned that 
you feel confident that the high grades in hole 17 uh, will extend further to the north. And also one of your your objectives for 2024 is to, is to sort of like fill in that gap between the north zone and the south zone. What in particular, you know, gives you confidence that the grades in hole 17 extend further north? Um, the fact that we see it, the fact that we know we have high grade zones up in the, uh, up in the quote unquote north zone, um, there is, there's very little discontinuity within the geophysical signature. Uh, so it looks like we've got a lot of continuity to work with in terms of geology and geophysics. And there is a good correlation between geology and mineralization and geophysics and mineralization. So it's finding these more porous, these conglomerates are a very good host. And then we've got this, this kicker that kind of comes in a little bit later in the form of these mineralized dikes that can also bring in very, very strong grade. Um, if any, if anybody's at Roundup, we've got uh, a full box of one of these mineralized dikes, I believe, from hole eleven uh, on the on the table. So it'd be good for for everyone to have a look at. And then our, you know, our mineralized conglomerate always, always looks pretty pretty spectacular for for BC porphyry rock. Um, so yeah, it's basically it's this continuity that we see uh, through a number of different uh, different avenues: the the geophysics, the geology, and the uh, the very good indication we have that we we see this much much further to the north so yeah there's there's and there's zero historical drilling here it was historically not logged very sediment covered and it was just completely untested and that's why i mean that's why we're really really encouraged by this season hole eight discovered a new zone hole 11 confirmed and expanded upon it and hole 17 expanded it further uh and it's quite a big distance from where any drilling was previous to 2023. Um, and it's completely open <laughs> up to the north. Uh, and it's looking like from the geophysical signature that that's kind of wrapping around to the southeast as well. There's some more geophysical surveying that needs to be done, but there's a lot of broad similarities between the sulfide composition of the mineralization in hole nine way off to the southeast and what we see in this newer western zone in hole 17. So just looking at the drill plan map and the pro property boundaries, is there anything that cuts it off? I mean, I guess you have a property boundary out to the west, so that might cut it off. I, I don't know how far, that's like 300 meters, 400 meters away, uh, just just based upon my, my eyeballing it. Um, is there anything cutting it off to the south and to the north, or is that just wide open? Uh, yeah, let me just, right now we're looking at, there's what we interpret to be a fairly large fault running along the, the Creek Valley about 300-ish meters to the, uh, to the west. Um, and so, you know, right now that's kind of where we're focusing our exploration. I mean, we will see, we will see what, what drilling reveals. Uh, to the north, there's, there's no real large structure other than yeah the property boundary boundary the far north of the property and and same goes with to the uh, to the east uh, we know we do have a, a a big fault in the magnetic signature that runs roughly along the western third of the the Babine porphyry stock intrusion uh, but so far we don't really see any offset uh, due to that fault in the mineralization. So it looks like that fault was a pre-existing structure that likely uh, was responsible for the emplacement of the, of the porphyry stock. Got it, okay. And now this is a question, I guess, for both of you guys. Um, great results, tech uh, topped up for 19.9%. You got Charlie Gregg in. Uh, I think you guys have around four or five million, not exactly sure, but you know, you're fully funded. I'm not sure you're, uh, how many you know meters you're fully funded for, but great results, a lot of encouragement, some momentum definitely coming into 2024. How big of a drill program do you guys need to plan here to do this, uh, you know, justice based upon some of these you know results and, and a new finds that you made in in 2023? I mean, I see the objectives. 
You want to fill in the north and south zones. You want to prioritize the high grade area around 2317. You want to find a new jewel box. It's a lot of drilling. Uh, how big is this program going to be in 2024? Well, so far right now, Rob, you know, we're funded for a similar size program that we had last year called 7,000 meters, 10 holes, which can still uncover a lot. Like that's, that's big enough to really suss out this, this south zone and just, you know, really have people believe because we, we know there's mineralization everywhere. Uh, the most important part is, you know, where, where is that high grade? You know, blue sky, blue sky for us, it, it'd probably be 18 uh, to 22,000 meters. You're looking at, you know, probably a little bit of a, a bigger budget, probably another 3 million bucks. Um, but, you know, I've been very careful looking after, you know, the cap structure. Um, you know, we, we got burned when we did that, you know, quote unquote retail raise last January, got coupon clippers, comes with a discount, broker fees, warrants. It's just killer. So that's why I made it my goal uh, just to look after investors and make sure we essentially had, you know, dilution by not dilution and, and having tech come in there, you know, starting in, in May and then again in August. And that August raise is so important because I had a really good confidence that we'd have some good drill holes uh, to end the season. And I didn't want the stock to have an overhang because people were expecting us to do a raise. And we want to make sure we had at least enough, uh, you know, right now that we can say we're going to do uh, another drill program. But, you know, to get to that 20,000 meter program, we don't even need another raise. Um, those warrants, uh, if they get, you know, um, executed, uh, those will be more than enough to cover us. And then, as you know, we, you know, tech loves our property. They've come in three times in the last, you know, nine months to invest. So, you know, I'm not I'm not going to count my chickens before they hatch, but, you know, we'll likely get another top up uh, from tech and, and probably at a premium. So that's kind of the idea there. We're, we're, we, we want more money. We don't need more money, uh, but we have flexibility and we have funding options. And, you know, I hope that funding option doesn't come uh, with retail because quite frankly, if retail wants a stock, they're going to have to buy in the open market. And eventually that supply is going to dry up, dry up because I'm getting calls as of Monday from people that I've never got calls from before, funds that are investing in the company. Um, you know, I won't name the name, but I got a call from a really big name miner that runs a very large company. And he loved our results. He bought a million shares in the open market and today he's going to buy more. So smart people are starting to understand that. I'm just hoping the retail understands. Right now, retail is kind of two years behind. So uh, buckle up and, and watch out. Ah, oh, bashing retail again, Tony. Damn. It's hard to be a retail investor these days. I'm not bashing. I'm not bashing <laughs> retail. I'm not bashing retail. I'm bashing the way that the mechanics are to raise money when you include retail, whereby you know you raise a million dollars and you have forty different investors. People put five thousand bucks in. It comes with warrants. It just causes a lot of push down. Right. I'm trying to look after retail mm -hmm. because if I if I minimize dilution, I keep out those warrants. Those shares do better. I'm looking after the current shareholders. So shares yeah. will go up a lot quicker and we're just trying to get out from underneath these warrants and we're almost there. Yeah, I get that. And, and I was, I was joking there. Um, I, I think that's a really important point. And the junior mining sector has a real challenge because of how difficult it can be to raise capital uh, at, at times. And, and 2022 and 2023 were both very challenging years in terms of financing and companies really got punished, you know, like anytime they had to come to the market to raise. So the fact that AE has been able to do these uh, financings, you know, with TAC, with no broker fees, no warrants, uh, they, that really gives you guys an advantage and it's helped to, to preserve the, the, the share structure. I, I want to ask another question, but I also want to open the floor to anybody else who would like to ask a question to Tony or Neil. Uh, please, please ask to speak and I'll, and I'll call on you if you have a question for them. Uh, I think this question is for Neil. One of the things that really stood out to me about the whole 17 result was the, the, the Molly 431.4 parts per million, uh, Molly, you know, in there and, and thus notably higher Molly grades than some of the other holes. And just from the porphyry model, um, more, more generally speaking, that usually means that you're vectoring in on something higher grade. Is that, is that true in this case? What do the, the higher Molly grades, you know, tell you, Neil? Yeah, the, the higher Molly is very interesting to see. Um, 
it's not as common that you see a copper gold rich porphyry as well as a copper moly rich porphyry. So to have the three elements corresponding for a roughly even amount in that copper equivalent calculation is somewhat unique. So it's a, and there's a bit of a different distribution to the molybdenite mineralization versus what we see with the chalcopyrite and the bornite. So we commonly see broad zones of, of chalcopyrite dissemination um, and bornite dissemination, as well as, you know, frequent stringers and, and veinlets of chalcopyrite and bornite throughout the, the copper mineralized zones. Uh, the molybdenite is a bit more discreet. It tends to focus in in coarser veins and quartz and in hydrate veins that, that cut the, the disseminated mineralization. So it almost seems like the molybdenite is coming in maybe at a little bit of a later stage. I mean, this time it could all be very close in the grand scheme of things. Our, our geochronology we've done so far, uh, we get about a 51 million year age for the, the rhenium osmium dating through the, the molybdenite. Uh, and when we do zircon dating through the various different intrusions, we get something very similar. You have 52 million years plus or minus. So, I mean, with the accuracy of these geochron methods, they're basically at the same time. But we have a bit of indication then that molybdenite might be coming in just a touch later. Um, so, yeah, it's it's you know, it's evidence of a couple different pulses of, of mineralization and it's it's very nice that they've all kind of coincided around this whole 11 whole 17 area what is interesting is we see that same molybdenum copper and gold signature way way out to the east in hole nine um and so i think there's still a lot of encouragement out there we don't have a ton of information out there aside from geophysics because there's no historical drilling and there's there's no outcrop exposure. So um, I think in order to to go forward and, and explore with a bit more confidence out there next year, uh, we're going to run a few more IP lines and just have more confidence at, at depth. But but that molybdenite mineralization specifically is is quite interesting, quite unique and, and very encouraging. Uh, Neil, if I could jump in here, I think that really we're talking to a geologist the other day, and he brought up a really good point. And Neil can kind of follow up with what I'm going to say. Um, but what's really important is that this high grade zone that we're hitting, um, which usually kind of indicates a core, is not the type of rocks that core would be. So the thought is, you know, we want to expand this high grade zone, but the thought is there could be a high grade core or kind of feeder source that's feeding this higher grade, you know, towards surface and, and where is it and does it exist? And it very likely could exist. So um, like Neil, maybe follow up on that and how we find that. Well, yeah, I mean, like Robert said earlier, uh, the best vector for, for copper and gold is, is copper and gold. Um, we have a really good knowledge of right now in the North and South, where this, this high grade mineralization is trending. So one way to explore that is to do a bit more modest step outs and flesh that out. Um, another way to explore that is rebolster that geophysics, look for those correlations, which we already see some very good, strong correlations between our best mineralized zones and a moderate IP chargeability response within that very broad halo. Um, what we need to do is run a few more deep lines and get a bit more confidence at depth um, because, you know, the historical survey only went down to about 200 meters. So, um, yeah, what a likely scenario is and what's starting to kind of materialize here with, with our investigations is that we very well could have multiple high-grade zones within a broad, broad, broad zone of, of moderate mineralization. Uh, and, you know, that can make for not terrible economics, especially if some of that is very close to surface, like we know it is in hole one and two, uh, which again was a very big step out from the historical mineralization. Uh, we've been almost accused by, by some people of uh, back in 2022, twinning the best mineralization with hole one and two. And those were a hundred meter step outs. We, we intersected or got close to intersecting a 2008 hole that was drilled 
collared much further away and drilled quite shallowly, but that wasn't down till about 240 meters depth. So that was all new near surface expansion and it shows there's very strong gold and copper grade right near surface and, and much larger footprint than was historically understood. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely possible that there are some higher grade zones and definitely possible that they're bigger than, than what we've encountered now. Um, but what we do know is that it is all enveloped by fairly decent copper grade aside from those zones. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're standing there. And again, if anybody has a question, please ask the speaker calling you. I've got one more question for you guys. And, and I think that was a great point you made, Neil, about the scale here. I mean, going through the, the presentation... We're talking about a 1,500 meter by 1,500 meter footprint that has been drilled and can continue to hit copper and gold grades uh, at 1,000 meter depth. So this is a significant footprint here uh, that continues to demonstrate uh, impressive copper, gold, and even molly in, in, in some holes. You know, the grades... Uh, could be economic uh, based upon some of the you know existing mines in this area of BC. Um, I guess Tony, final question for you. You know, Texas at nineteen point nine percent stake in American Eagle. Some investors might say, well, you know, Texas just gonna take this and gobble it up eventually, and, and they'll get it for a good price. You know, you know when the time is right. How do you? build some competitive tension with another large mining company and how do you keep up the momentum in 2024 yeah look uh, another good question rob tech's a really good partner of ours um you know they i worked at a mining company before i know how it goes these companies would rather buy you for 500 million to a billion dollars and have it completely de-risked or pretty close to de-risked than buying you, for example, for 50 to $100 million at kind of the, the spot we are, you know, right now. There's still a lot of drilling to come. And I think they're comfortable with the 20% that they have, and they'll probably keep on participating at, at 20%. Um, you know, I get asked a lot of questions, you know, comparing us to Hercules Silver. You know, it's frustrating because, you know, I, there's room for a lot of really great companies out there. I don't think we're competitors with Hercules Silver. I think they're a really great company with a great potential deposit, same as us. But, you know, if, if you compare the two of us, you know, we both have really great holes. I think we have more good holes. And, and I think their most recent hole was was maybe a little higher grade. Ours had a wired or interval. You know, Idaho and BC, both great jurisdictions. I think BC is better just for the history of copper production. You know, they're partners with Barrick. Uh, they have a little more cash than us. We're partners with Tech. But, um, you know, com talking about competitive friction, you know, the big difference between us and them is we don't have a rofer on, on you know, the ownership that, that tech has. So that creates, at least in the investor's mind, you know, optionality for us and potential for someone else, you know, to come in. And I think that this is a big enough potential deposit someday that, you know, it would probably make sense for two companies to come in and, and take us out uh, someday. And, you know, I treat tech just like everyone else. They're not JVing on the asset. They don't have a rofer. They're a shareholder. So how do I look after shareholders? I make sure I do smart deals. We drill the best we can and we minimize dilution. So we, our fiduciary duties look after a shareholder's Texas shareholder. If that means bringing someone else down the line, it's going to give us a really good offer. You know, that's in the card. So uh, all options are on the table. Preference is to do a corporate deal at some point, uh, but we'll see how it goes. And, you know, drilling just follows, you know, more good drilling. If you look at us, it's like anything in life, school, whatever. All I want is progression. I want you guys to get better. I want a company to get better. If you look at us, we started last year 900 meters of 0.37% copper equivalent. We ended this year at 606 meters of 0.7% copper equivalent. The more we drill, the better this looks and the better we get. So if you thought our last two years of drilling was good, that was based on geophysics. Wait to see what's in store once we start drilling on geology. We've got no overhang with financing. We're going to start drilling in four months. Coming out with a big technical presentation with Neil and his team probably next week. You know, news release, giving people more information on the geophysics. So full steam ahead. Um, looking forward to see what 2024 has in store for us. Okay, I, th I think you. I think you said it well. We're 
just about at the 30 minute mark. Just keep moving the ball down the field like the Bills did in Miami on Sunday night and win the game. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Neil and Tony. And I look forward to seeing you in Vancouver in uh, just over a week. Yeah, it'll be exciting. Come check out the court roundup if anyone's down there. Uh, we'll have the course back on Wednesday and Thursday. Are there no are there no quick questions from anybody on the uh, on the call at all? No, nobody's raising their hands. We got we got a lot of people here, but nobody's asking a question. So I see Nate Smith on there. Cannot believe he doesn't have one question. <laughs> Nate, Nate, you're being called on. I don't know. So sometimes people could could could, uh, could have these spaces on and be doing something else and not be in a a place, you know, where they can speak comfortably. Um, yeah. I, I, I got through all my questions. I think, I think you guys really summarized it well. I will upload this to my YouTube in the next few days and it will be available for everybody to re-listen to. Thanks a lot. Oh, there he is. Hold on. It's not over yet. Nate. Hey guys, I'm having some technical difficulties here today. Can hear you fine. Oh, he's having some. Okay, and then he just went off. Okay. Well, I guess that's it, guys. Uh, have a great day, and I'll see you in Vancouver. Thanks a lot, Rob. Cheers. Yeah, thanks.